It's obvious we should all retire and go to the coffee shop and discuss important things about people in power. You're going to have to forgive me because I have sinned. Um, I voted I voted for Brexit, but I wanted the Leavers to win. And my motives were very impure. Because for the Remainers to remain and to win was going to be much of the same, was going to stay on the same road, and would be ultimately fairly bland and fairly predictable. For the Leavers to win was going to create a mini-revolution and was going to change all the dynamics on this island and on other islands within this archipelago and, in fact, was going to force all of us and all of politics to re-examine the relationships and the totality of the relationships within this island. So even though I voted and even though I am a fundamental European, I think that there is a need for a re-examination of relationships. I think that there has been for a good number of years a need for a re-examination of the relationships within these islands, between England and Ireland, between Ireland North and South, between Ireland and Scotland, and between Scotland and England. It hasn't been examined and it hasn't changed much for a long, long, long period of time. And that, in a certain way, as seen and as incarnated within this island, within the history of this island, is and has been unsustainable. What in some ways has been surprising, and perhaps the only surprising thing that has come out of Brexit, has been the depth of the emotion and the depth of the divisions. But in our small island, it was becoming a little bit annoying listening to half-baked theories, certainly in my opinion half-baked theories, that the nationalist people of Ireland had given up on the desire or the possibility or even the desirability of unity and that the people particularly in the south of Ireland had really lost the interest as they had become richer uh, and better rooted within the island of Ireland. I've always thought that that was a half-baked theory. And I think recent statistics and recent research is showing that that is, if not a half-baked, at least quarter-baked. There is still that desire. There is still that ambition. There is still that hope. On the other side, we have had to listen and look and examine and been subject to the old juvenile mantra of dissident republicanism, uh, of militant Irish republicanism, with the mantra that if only England would leave Ireland, then all other matters would be fine and all other things could be solved. And that needed examined and that needed addressed. And in a peculiar way, Brexit addresses that and forces that out into the open. That particular belief, deep, fundamental and unchanging up to this moment in time that exists within militant Irish republicanism. So in these days of outrageous politics and in these days of outrageous political statements, I want to make what I think many people will consider an outrageous statement. I think Ireland is now safe from the worst of Brexit. I think that the people who are going to suffer most from the consequences of Brexit are going to be England and Scotland. I think that we have found a fairly safe harbour. And the reason I think that we have found this fairly safe harbour is because not all that many months ago, the European Union said and this had not been in the original agreement, to my opinion, but is now 
I think, in fairly solid ground. That the European Union would not discuss a future trade deal with, Brit with Britain if it in any ways or until, we put it this way, until the Irish border issue was solved. That, in a way, was a, a solid moment within us finding a safe place. The second thing that I think helped to find that, if you put the two of them together, was a statement not all that many months ago from Nancy Pelosi and from Richard Neal when they came to Ireland and came to McGee University College in Derry and said very strongly and very authoritatively that there would be no trade deal with England, with Britain, if the Good Friday Agreement was interfered with in a way that they considered negative. Pelosi is well known. Richard Neal perhaps is well, less well known. But he's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which is a very powerful committee which deals with these issues within the American system. Put those two situations together, and I think that we have found, for Ireland, a fairly safe place, a fairly safe harbour going forward. Brexit winds will continue to blow. There will be outcomes, there will be consequences, but not at the existential level that we thought and perhaps feared might happen. So things have changed for us, for the better. But perhaps that is an outlandish statement on the day when, when Johnson has just been elected. <coughs> but where do we, Northern Ireland, Ireland, where do we go from here? Where do, we, where do we sit within this, even if it is a safe harbour, even if I consider it now a safe harbour? Well, at the moment, the two governments are discussing with the political parties in the north the possibility of getting Stormont up and running again. That's no bad thing, because it's better to have a tent in which people can have their politics, and even if Within that tent, there's a lot of huffing and puffing and efforts to blow the tent down. I think it's better to have the tent up and running and there as a source of some form of shelter. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. I think the people want it. I think that the desire in the north of Ireland among most of the people is that Stormont does, in fact, get up and running, despite but sometimes the commentators will tell us. And I think the reason for that is not just to do with economics and not just to do with politics. I think it is to do quite often with safety and with a sense of safety. I think people in Northern Ireland feel more safe when Storm is up and running than when the, when the parties are with inside that tent, even if they're not making a great fist of it. But Brexit has brought politics to a different and to a larger place. Well, to be more accurate, Brexit has brought our politics to a different and to a larger place quicker than we expected it. We weren't perhaps given the amount of time and the amount of space that we might have otherwise been given without Brexit. The big question now is, how are the people of this island, north and south, going to live together? That is now the existential question. And how are we going to find, how are we going to make the structures that's going to allow that to happen in a way going forward into the future is much be better, much healthier than what we have had in the past? Well, I think what is clear in broad definitions is that nationalism wants the conversation. Nationalism, whatever way you define it, wants the conversation, is ready for the conversation. What it hasn't yet decided is who should lead that conversation. 
who's the best to lead that conversation, who should be in that conversation. We're already saying things like Sinn Féin are not the people to lead it. The Irish government are the people to lead it. Some other people, perhaps like myself, are saying that the Irish government perhaps are not even the best people to lead it, that the people who really should lead it are Fianna Fáil. But perhaps that's a question that the audience might want to deal with later on. Unionism, on the other hand, is fraying a little bit at the ages. And we're getting the odd head popping up here and there saying we have to have this conversation. And we're getting very interesting heads popping up and saying we need to have this conversation, even within the last couple of weeks. But the majority of unionism is terrified. Is terrified even at the prospect of the conversation. And it's terrified because it believes in its heart and in its soul that to even admit the need for the conversation inevitably concludes the conversation in a particular direction. In other words, to enter the room is itself an admission that there has to be an outcome which is not to your desire or to your satisfaction. And that, in a way, is the real block is a big block, is the existential block. All of which reveals a bit of a dilemma for nationalism. Because if nationalism wants a conversation and unionism can't really yet face the prospect of the, of the conversation, what does nationalism do? Well, nationalism has lived with unionism for a hundred years now. And it knows how dogged it is. It knows how fearful it is. And it knows how difficult it is to get it into the political room and into the political conversation. The truth of the matter is that unionism has been dragged into every major political conversation within the last hundred years. It has been dragged in there. It has never walked in there for its own very good reasons. And nationalism knows that a border poll is a crude mechanism, particularly after the experience of Brexit. It knows it has seen, it has it incarnated, that to do a crude border poll seems to be, and is, and is more likely than anything else, to be crude, unsophisticated, and undesirable. But on the other hand, it knows that if there's no border poll and there's no threat of a border poll, unionism is not going to move. Unionism will stay where it is. And all the reconciliation and all the gestures are more than unlikely to bring unionism to that conversation. And there's little good, in my opinion, in southern politicians telling northern nationalists that you really don't want this crude instrument at the moment, or in the next year, or the next two years, or the next foreseeable years, unless they put forward an alternative. And of course the alternative is beginning to surface at the moment, it's beginning to bubble up that we need some kind of uh, forum, that we need some kind of all-Ireland forum, that we need some, some kind of conversation that embraces all of the political uh, backgrounds and traditions on this island. But the Irish government, I think as Claire mentioned, is terrified of putting Brexit together with unity. Might be terrified, but I don't think there's any option. Because that's the reality in which we are now faced that's the reality in which we're in, and that's the reality that's going to dominate politics. No matter what any of us say, that's where we are. So we probably need that kind of thing, that type of forum. We had one in the past. I think we need one fairly soon. And I think that unionism will probably huff and puff 
and not come to it initially. But I think that the experience of Brexit is that the farmers, business, civic society in Northern Ireland and the softening ages of unionism will come initially and the politics and the economics and the society will pull politics in with it ultimately. But this, looking at the McGill Summer School, I noticed that the the brochure said the centre can't hold. Now that was about globally. But I thought, how do we put that and how do we place that statement within Ireland and within our present politics? How do we ground that if the centre can't hold? I'm not 100% sure of this, so if anybody can correct me, please do. But I'm nearly 90% sure that John Hume once said, if not more than once said, that you cannot build a bridge from the centre of the river. And the reason I remember that is that I thought to myself, is that actually correct? Is that engineeringly correct? Can't you build a bridge from the centre? I remember thinking that, and I remember thinking that was John Hume said that. And that surprised me, because I thought, well, John, you might be seen, and your party might be seen, as in fact the centre ground. You might be seen as the middle of the river people. So it stuck in my head. So I think it was him who said it. And of course he was referring to the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland at the time. And the Alliance Party are pretty much in the news these days. And I think that they would be defined, broadly speaking, terrible big generalization, I admit. But generally speaking, they would be the middle ground. So I just want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about that because, again, Claire mentioned it, I think it's a major important feature. Alliance is big news. It's done well, incredibly well, in the last two elections. It now has a presence and it has a, an authority that it certainly didn't have over the last 20, 30 years. And it has, persu it, it has persuaded many voters that our real problem is a constitutional issue and our, our reliance on the constitutional issue for our political stances. It has certainly, the Alliance Party, it has certainly re-energized the narrative that that, that concentration on the constitutional issue is our real problem. That that is our problem. That is our fundamental problem. Because its response and its, to, its solution to that fundamental problem is neutrality. Alliance does not have a position on the constitutional issue. It says that it is not a unionist party, and it says that it is not a nationalist party. It doesn't take sides, and every member of the Alliance party has the right to be either unionist, nationalist, or nothing. That is its position. Now, I think that there are very few people who would not accept that Alliance has been a party of great courage and great integrity within the history of Northern Ireland. If you look in the last two to three weeks around those skirmishes around bonfires, Alliance have been incredibly brave, incredibly brave, or at least the ones uh, that I have heard and seen speak it have been incredibly brave. And I think that they have been very brave and very wanting to be good and to be worthy and to be supportive and helpful to all of the people of Northern Ireland and indeed to all the people of Ireland. That, I think, is their history and that is a noble history. But political success comes at a price. With increased presence, and with that increased authority, which I now believe that they have, comes great responsibility. 
Because it could be argued that neutrality has served them well, that having no position on the Constitution has served them well. But neutrality is not an answer to any fundamental question. Neutrality is a piece of blank paper. It has little to contribute to the debate that this place needs and is going to have in the coming months and years. No matter who wants to have it or not have it or stop it happening. That debate is breaking out and is going to continue. At a time when constitutional questions are so dominant, not just here, right across these islands, neutrality is a cop-out. Neutrality is a cop-out. It's not worthy of a serious political party, and neither is it sustainable going forward. Because Brexit, a border poll, demographic chains that have been referred to in the previous speeches. They're all akin to a hydro dam that's upstream of us. And that dam, or those dams, are threatening to burst. And they can burst uncontrollably. And they can drown. They can swamp and drown what lies in its way. Or if they're released controlled, in a controlled and ordered fashion, then they will not do any harm. They may wet the ground, they made some of the ground a bit soggy, but there will be no massive damage done. And whether they like it or not, in the coming months and years, Alliance is going to play a major part in that control or lack of control because that is the role it has now been gifted, or that is the role that has now fallen upon its shoulders. Of course, that, that responsibility falls on all our shoulders, and it falls upon the shoulders of every political party. But the Alliance vote has always attracted a section of moderate unionism. And because of the societal and religious changes that have happened here in the South, Coupled with a desire in this island, particularly in the north, to stay in Europe, and an increasing number of like-minded unionists mythic, have changed over or given their vote to alliance, then that puts them in a very strong and important and transforming position. And that constituency which they have now attracted is extremely important because it is part of the unionist family. And that family are the most fearful, the most cautious, and sometimes even the most obstinate in embracing the need to have the frank conversation, which I think is now beginning to happen and which will increase in the coming months and years. That doesn't mean, by the way, and I'm not proposing, that Alliance must declare itself as either unionist or nationalists. That's not what I'm saying. But it does mean that it cannot be neutral. It cannot be neutral in contributing to the conversations and the negotiations that this society must engage with and engage in. It cannot, to remain neutral would be irresponsible and even dangerous. Because they are in the middle, because they are the central ground, and because of the numbers of votes that they're now attracting, they will be in a very strong position to prompt, to promote, and at times to steer the conversation and to steer the negotiations. A calm and a sensitive conversation is not always what you get in politics. But we're in a messy place, and we need good, thoughtful people and parties to get involved in that conversation and to be honest in that conversation. But what we cannot allow to happen, in my opinion, in the next months and years is to say we won't have the conversation on the one hand 
or to say on the other hand that the conversation is already closed down and we know precisely where we're going. Because the conversation is too big for that and too important for that. And all of us must be involved in it. And all of us, I think, in a peculiar way, want to be involved in it. Because I think we're tired of the troubles and the hatred and the pettiness and the narrowness. And I think we want the grand conversation. And I think the time has come to woo each other. And on the one hand, nationalism is going to have to be incredibly generous. I think that there is nothing that unionism wants or asks for that it will not get. Anything. I hear sometimes people saying, oh, I wouldn't join the Commonwealth. We will join the Commonwealth, if that is part of it. Will there be a regional parliament? Of course there will be a regional parliament, if that's what they want. Will there be places in the House of Lords, if that's what they want? Yes. But unionism has not got the right to keep saying in the present realities, in the present statistics, in the present atmosphere, to keep saying no, no, no. Thank you.